when disassembling your computer system, we've got a particular order that we should do it in. First, we should remove the keyboard and mouse from the back of the computer, remove the monitor, remove the serial and parallel devices, remove the network cables, speaker cables, joystick, modem, phone line, remove the power cable, then you're able to remove the system case lid. After that, you can remove the internal power cables from the storage devices. And then after that, the internal power cables are just simply the cables that are connecting all of your storage devices together. From there, we're able to remove the hard drive and other storage devices. And then from there, we can remove interface cards. After that, we're able to remove the CPU. Then we can take out the RAM and we can take out all the cables and system board and then we can simply remove the screws and clips holding the system board in place. There are a few things to keep in mind when removing your certain cables. You should just make a special note of where they were attached and what order they were attached in. Make sure that uh, you make note of your jumper settings and then when you're ready to reassemble your computer system you just simply start from the reverse order and then you would place all the cables on the system board the RAM, the CPU and move up the order in the reverse. What we're going to talk now about is the boot sequence when your computer first initializes the process that it goes through. When we refer to the BIOS what this is, as we saw earlier, it's a chip that sits on your motherboard. And this is the first set of your instructions that your computer receives when your system is turned on. It essentially tells the video card to start, the hard drive to initialize, and it tells your keyboard how to work. Without a BIOS, your computer wouldn't be able to start. It's typically, these days, BIOS is in a form of ROM which is EEP-ROM, -E which is also Electronical Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later on. And this allows the BIOS to be updated and allows for new versions of the hardware to be recognized. When you're updating your BIOS, it's also referred to as flashing your BIOS. And what you're essentially doing, you're rewriting information on your BIOS. You're sending a specific electronic charge to the BIOS chip. We're going to go ahead and we're going to continue with the boot process. And the first step of the boot process, as soon as you touch your power button, the power turns on onto your computer, the electricity flows onto your motherboard, and it initializes basically the motherboard's uh, power processors. The next, the system goes into your BIOS, and this is where the processor reads the instructions for initializing the BIOS. So what the POST stands for, it stands for Power On Self Test. And this is when the, Bi when the BIOS, it does a system check for the critical hardware. Checks if there's a presence of a video card and checks for errors that could be detected on the system. And this is done through a series of beeps that you've probably heard when you're turning on your computer system there's beeps through your motherboard speaker and we're just going to go over what the beeps represent if you hear generally one beep this is um, could be a refresh error and what this means um, you could usually fix it by trying to reseat the memory or replacing the memory the next one is the parity error these are your typical um, they're the AMD BIOS codes so if you get uh, two beeps, we're going to talk about the Ward BIOS codes after this, which is slightly different depending on which kind of BIOS codes your system's functioning under. So we've got two beeps, which is a parity error, and generally to fix that you could try working with the memory again, reseeding it, or replacing the memory. The, if you receive three beeps, once again it could be um, your memory error, and you can try to reseat the, the memory to fix that problem. If we get four beeps, that means that we're having problems with the timer and the motherboard's malfunctioning 
and we probably have to replace one of the units. Five beats, we've got the same thing where we've got a processor error and the motherboard is once again malfunctioning. Six beeps is a keyboard controller chip error. Seven is the processor exception. This is once again, it's a motherboard error and more than likely you probably have to replace some components. With eight beeps, our, it's our display memory and here we've we're got a problem with our display adapter. Here we would most likely have to replace the video card in the eight beep situation. With nine beeps, we've got a problem with our ROM checksum error and we've got some problems with our BIOS chips. 10 is uh, CMOS shutdown. This is once again, it's a motherboard problem where we'd have to replace the unit. And 11 is cache memory. And with no beeps, we might not have any power to the motherboard. The motherboard might be damaged. Or we could check the seating of different control chips and make sure that the chips are seated properly. So after completion of the post, we go to the boot sequence, goes to the video BIOS, boot and peripheral startup and this is where the BIOS and other equipment uh, boot. After that we've got a simple system check where the system it runs a self check on the memory, hard drive, different controllers, the IO and parallel ports, keyboard and other system devices and it lists off any errors that might occur. After that, we've got a plug and play check, and this is the plug and play BIOS where it initializes the plug and play controller, and it also initializes any plug and play equipment. Number seven, we've got here the post sequence summary display, and this is the BIOS. It shows a screen with information about the system, it shows hard drive setting, addresses, serial and parallel ports, RAM, RAM cache values, and other information. And after that, of course, we've got the active partition boot search, where it searches the drive for an active partition in order to continue with the boot process. Most BIOSes are set to search the A drive and then the C drive for the boot sector, or the master boot rector record. You can also set your boot to be from CD-ROMs or from SCSI hard drives depending on how you set your BIOS. And after that we've got the operating system startup. So once the boot partition is found and we've found our operating system, it begins to initiate the operating system. Working with your CMOS and changing your basic parameters, CMOS is short for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. The most common way to access your CMOS is by pressing your delete key as your computer system is booting up. We've got some common CMOS settings here that most, um, most of the time you will be able to see. We've got the CPU, the internal cache, and what this does, it enables and disables the internal cache of the CPU. If you're having troubles with errors displaying the internal cache, um, it can help alleviate this problem. The next is the external cache. And this um, enables or disables the external RAM cache. Next is the boot device. And this is um, the device that you selected for the primary boot. There's the boot up floppy seek, and it searches for a floppy drive during the post. And it gives an error if there's no floppy drive during the post. So depending on if you've enabled or disabled it. There's the swap floppy drive, and this allows you to change the order that the operating system access the floppy drive during the boot. There's the quick power on self-test, and this is enabled, will limit the post memory test. Next, we've got antivirus protection, and this will start a scan of the boot sector 
of the boot device when the operating system is loaded. We've got the video BIOS shadow and this allows the BIOS to copy video ROM code off the add-on video card. We've got the system BIOS cacheable and when this is enabled it allows the ROM area to be cacheable. We've got the BIOS cacheable, the video BIOS cacheable, and this will also cause certain memory areas to be cached, and the same with the video RAM cacheable. The USB allows the computer to turn off the universal serial bus controller on the motherboard. If you have an onboard sound card, the on-chip sound allows you to turn this off. The IDE controller allows you to turn on and off the primary and secondary IDE controllers. We've got the primary, secondary, master, slave mode, and this is what the uh, motherboards automatically set the modes. So we've got the init display first, which is for computers with ha that have both AGP and PCI video card installed. And it allows you to choose which is a primary video card. There's parallel port type, and this allows you to change the parallel port modes between EPP and ECP and SPP. There's a serial port that lets you to set the IRQ for serial ports 1 and 2, and will allow you to turn off serial ports if peripheral I.O. boards are installed. The PNP OS installed allows you to adjust your operating system if you have your plug and play or if you don't have plug and play enabled. We're also able to reset the configuration data for the plug and play, the PNP. Hard disk capacity allows you to adjust the capacity of your hard disks. Floppy drive allows you to adjust the capacity of your floppy drives. We're able to also modify the memory processor details and the time and date in the CMOS.